We're talking Matthew 10 today. We're going to be in the last part of this chapter. And it is about the cost of discipleship, that there is, an, there is a, a cost to following Christ. So I'm going to start in verse 34. It says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So as we have walked through this chapter, Jesus has called uh, the disciples to himself. He has called these 12 men that they are to come and follow him. He has commissioned them and he has sent them out. Uh, as apostles, as missionaries. This is the first missionary journey uh, we see in Scripture. He has sent them. He has given them specific instructions. And as he has sent them, he has also given them these warnings that they will face opposition. It's not a question of if. It is only a question of when. They will face persecution. And when that comes, how they are to respond because the gospel is divisive. And he even tells them that there will be family divisions because of the gospel and that they will be faced by uh, the religious leaders. They will be um, faced against the government. There will be those who will be uh, against them. And then he tells them not to fear, though, what man can do but fear God, to have a healthy fear of God himself that he will take them through, whatever the case may be. And then he comes to the latter part here and he is writes these words or speaks these words that are a bit of a hard saying. Uh, Do you not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? But no, I have come to bring I have not come to bring peace, but a sword that really kind of flies in the face of, of so much of what we envision. Uh, of Jesus that he said I've not come to bring peace but a sword because we think of a sword we think of a sword fight we think of battles we think of wars that uh, have been fought and how swords are 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 a, a weapon but here we know scripturally that the sword is the word of God Uh, Paul reminds us that it is the one weapon apart from prayer that we have but he is going to cause division And he even speaks to that within the family. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt once said, There has never yet been a man who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. So if you think it's about ease and uh, not making a difference, then you probably will not be known after your life here is gone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German uh, pastor, theologian who uh, would die, at the hands of the Nazis just within days of uh, being liberated, wrote, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. It is going to cost us to fully follow Christ. There will be a payment that we will each have to be willing to examine what we will pay. Henry Martin was a... A missionary. He was a British missionary to India uh, in the 1800s. While he was there, he received a, a burden for the Persians. And Persian, uh, Persia is modern day Iran. And he knew they did not have uh, the Word of God in their language. So uh, he set out to translate the entire New Testament and the Psalms in nine months, which is quite remarkable if you, if you consider. Uh, He was told he could not get it printed or circulated without the Shah of Iran's permission. 
So he traveled over 600 miles to Tehran, um, but was denied permission to even see the Shah. Uh, not to be discouraged, he then turned around and traveled over 400 miles back to a British ambassador who could give him uh, the proper paperwork he would need in order to present this to the Shah. Then traveled the 400 miles back to uh, Tehran, where he was able to get in to see the Shah. He did this, mind you, at night on the back of a mule uh, because of the heat of the day was so scorching uh, there in the area, uh, just to be able to be able to make the journey. As he finally arrived and was able to get permission uh, to uh, print and distribute the scriptures, uh, they finally were circulated in Persia, where 10 days later, uh, Henry Martin would die. And I I said all this to get to this quote. I just love this quote. He says, I sat and thought with sweet comfort and peace of my God. In solitude, my companion, my friend and comforter. Certainly not a life of ease, but a life worth remembering. That's what I think if we all could, we would love to have said. Certainly not a life of ease, but a life worth remembering. Just this past uh, Thursday, a a group uh, of us were at the International Learning Center. And if you go to the International Learning Center, if you go near their dining hall, there is a massive uh, plaque there on the wall. And on that plaque are all our IMB missionaries throughout the last um, 150 plus years who have died on the mission field. Uh, men and women who literally gave their all for the cause of Christ. And it has on the plaque everyone's name, um, uh, everybody, Lottie Moon and, and many others, uh, ones that had uh, faced great difficulties, but, but considered the cost and were willing to pay whatever it took to get the gospel to the people groups that God had sent them to. It's a very humbling reminder, um, a very... Um, very fitting that uh, we were able to see that this week. It's such a blessing that we have uh, the International Learning Center, literally 20 miles from where we stand, or literally a rock's throw from Mike and Cherry's house. If you would like to go to their house for lunch today, they can show you around the property. Mike's like, me telling people where I live. Um, I didn't give them directions specifically. So, uh, Nevertheless, it is such a blessing. And just Wednesday, uh, we sat here with a number of folks from the ILC, missionaries that are getting ready to go overseas in a number of months, who are going out in our community. They have been prayer walking and mapping the community. Uh, they were in um, Colonial Estates and Cosmo Village already this week. I've already gotten uh, calls from uh, families there um, that were... Um, heard about Air Church because these missionaries are are right here in our own community going out. They will be going out again this Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from about 2.30 to 6.30. If anybody wants to uh, get to know some of our IMB missionaries, get to hang out with them and go out with them, you're more than welcome to join them. We'll get you connected. Um, it's just an awesome group, 110 adults right now that are part of this current group and about 125 children uh, that will be going to just literally all over the world sharing the gospel who have considered the cost. So I find it very fitting that this is the passage we are in today uh, as we hear about this uh, work that God is doing uh, in Kenya and around the world. A couple of things real quick though. What are the characteristics of a true disciple? One, well, it has to, we have to look like the Lord. We will have to be willing to bear the very character of Christ. Acts 11 tells us that Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. The word Christian literally means little Christ. And it means that for you and I to to bear the name of Christian, that we are to manifest the very character of Christ, that we would bear the marks and the pattern of a Christ-centered life. Because when we are called Christians, it is who we represent is Christ. Galatians 2.20 says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you no longer got to be the one that made the decisions. 
when you came to faith in Christ, we surrender our life to Christ, that Jesus himself will be our Lord and Savior, and that we are now in Christ. It is Jesus who lives in us. And further, we see here in these passages that we are, if we are to follow Christ, there will be division. If we are going to follow Christ, we will even see families rise up against families. A man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. It says a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now we more than likely, not definitively, but more than likely will probably not face um, the kind of persecution and division that uh, families around the world uh, face when they come to faith in Christ. When you have uh, a Muslim family and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you will be cast out. You will be separated. You will no longer be considered a child of your own mother and father. You will be separated. There are those kids uh, today uh, in these schools uh, that, that Carol has mentioned about. Uh, you and I may face uh, some ridicule. They may decide to uh, not invite you to certain parts of the family, or they may uh, always be like, well, if you're going to come over, are you going to talk about that Jesus again? Are you going to consider that we're just all pagans? Yes, that's exactly what you are. Not that you would say those exact words, but, but you will potentially face some ridicule, but not more than likely to this extent. Some of you may have been uh, separated from your families because of the cause of Christ. But Jesus is simply making us understand here that if we are to follow Christ, then he has to be Lord of our life. It doesn't mean that we don't love our families, that you don't love your mom or your dad or your kids, but, but that love actually pales in comparison to the love we should have for Christ. So we are to be a genuine follower. And if we are to be a genuine follower, we will understand that the world will be against us. John 15 says, Then no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. Wouldn't it be a great uh, to have on your gravestone a friend of Jesus? For all that I've heard from my Father have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. We are to go and bear fruit so that whatever you ask in my father, so whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give to you. He may give to you these things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. To be a genuine father means we must be willing to face the very things that Christ himself faced. The, the, the mocking, the, 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 the words. We must be understanding, though, that they are against Christ and his gospel, not you and I. Martin Luther once said, if our gospel were received in peace, it would not be the true gospel. The gospel does divide. We should not be offensive, but the gospel will in many cases. So if we are to be like our Lord and we are to be a genuine father and we are to consider the cost and, and what it is, then, then what are those marks of a disciple? What should we look like? What are those areas of our life that we should consider? Well, the first is, uh, is we're just going to use this an acronym, but is that we should be missional. We are all called to live as missionaries. Charles Spurgeon said that we are either a missionary or an imposter. And this idea of being missional simply means that we are to live a lifestyle in which um, we are being representative of Christ and his work. Every disciple should strive to be an agent or a representative of the kingdom of God. And every follower should try to carry the mission of God into every sphere of his or her life. We are all missionaries sent into the world. Paul reminds the church at Corinth that therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And further to the Ephesians, he writes, And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. 
Consider Paul, I mean, uh, the greatest missionary ever uh, to walk this earth. Here, Paul, chained to a Roman soldier. Can you imagine the Roman soldiers as they got together and were like, I'm not going to get chained again to that guy. All he talks about is Jesus, 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 my Savior, my Lord, Jesus. All he does. But Paul did not waste opportunity. Every one of those Roman guards that were chained to Paul heard the gospel. He did not say, well, I guess this is it for me. I'm going to just sit here and take my punishment. No, he looked at this as an opportunity himself. That even though he was in chains, that maybe this was a, a means in which God would carry the gospel to areas he would never himself be able to. For these Roman guards would ultimately go around the world. Rome was uh, very large and in charge. And so as these guards that had been chained to Paul heard the gospel, uh, odds are that there were those that had came to faith in Christ. And as they would be sent to different outposts all around, they also took the gospel. Vance Havner, the old Baptist preacher, says the primary qualification for a missionary is not love for souls, as we so often hear, but love for Christ. If we love Christ, we will be compelled. We will live missionally. We will be then accountable, uh, accountable not just to each others, which we need. We need accountability one to another. Uh, we need brothers and sisters in Christ who will hold us accountable, who will uh, let us know when parts of our life are not aligning with our Christian walk, but also ones for encouragement. Uh, we need encouragement. We need support from a friend. Sometimes that is the missing ingredient in our battle against Satan. We need those who will walk along beside us. Hebrews 10, the author of Hebrews says, that let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Anybody here that could, that could use a little encouragement? We all need encouragement. At times, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard when you walk with Christ. You are sometimes uh, feeling like you may be the only one. And maybe in the environment you are in, maybe you are the only one. So to encourage each other in our walk with Christ is part of even our accountability. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer further says, A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone with himself. He experiences the presence of God and the reality of the other person. As long as I am by myself in the confession of my sins, everything remains in the clear. But in the presence of a brother, this sin has to be brought into the light. We are to carry each other's burdens. Al Mohler says that with power and responsibility must come accountability. A leader without accountability is an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> Amen. Next, we need to be reproducing. We need to be reproducible. Many of you have, have heard uh, stories about, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, Dawson Troutman founded the Navigators in 1933. He had been teaching high school and, and teaching Sunday school in his church. But in 1933, he and his friends decided they wanted to extend the work out to a, a few sailors in the U.S. Navy. He moved to San Diego. Uh, There's the large naval presence there. This is there, Dawson met a young man named Les Spencer. Uh, this man, Les Spencer, uh, had come to faith in Jesus Christ, so uh, Dawson decided to invest many hours with this young man in prayer, studying the Bible, memorizing Scripture. Sounds like Mike Holland a little bit there. Um, and then one of Spencer's shipmates came to him and asked him the secret for his changed life. Well, Les Spencer then took this man and brought him to Dawson Troutman and said to Dawson, teach him what you have taught me. I love this response. Dawson Troutman said, no, you teach him. Thus, starting this pattern of 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where they would invest in another and then in another. Well, Les Spence did, Spencer did teach that sailor, and soon there were two men meeting with others. Eventually, 125 men came to faith in Jesus Christ on the USS West Virginia. For those of you that know a little bit of your history, you will know the USS West Virginia ended up in Pearl Harbor. It was one of the ships that had been attacked in Pearl Harbor where thousands of men on that ship, I mean th uh, thousands of people that day, 
uh, would ultimately die. But those men, many of those men on the U.S. West Virginia had came to faith. And some of those men ultimately went home to glory that day. But for those who survived would go on to be part of a great movement uh, of navigators that would share the gospel and make disciples who make disciples. Uh, Dawson Troutman was uh, later speaking to a group of young people who had uh, been uh, considering going on to the foreign mission field. He asked this question. He says, how many of you have ever shared the gospel How many of you have seen someone come to faith because of your faithfulness? The majority, it says, admitted that they were ready to cross an ocean and learn a foreign language, but they had not yet shared the gospel with anyone near them. That is a sad statement for so many. That's why I love what the ILC is doing, that these missionaries, as they are learning about the culture and the context and the language in which they will be sending to, they are sending them right into this community, which is our community, to share the gospel. That they're not waiting until they get to uh, an area of the world that even may not have heard the gospel, but they're sharing the gospel right now. Here and now. Dawson Traubman gives these five reasons Christians do not reproduce. One is because of unconfessed sin. One is because we have sin in our hearts that we have not cried out to God in repentance for. And by the way, even unconfessed sin in our life can just simply not be an obedient to what God has called you and I to do. We always think that it's some uh, egregious act that we've committed or I haven't, you know, repented for, for you know, borrowing, stealing the pen at the funeral home the other day or whatever it is. But it's any unconfessed sin, not being faithful and and, and sharing the good news. Second, he says, it's the fear of man. We don't fear man. Um, I mean, we don't fear God, yet we fear man. We are fearful of the fact that if we do share the gospel, if we ask someone who is a young Christian to walk alongside them, we are fearful of rejection. We are fearful of them not wanting to be our friend. He says, further, a lack of spiritual purpose. We have no direction. We don't understand that what we are called to is to walk faithfully with Christ and to reproduce that in the lives of others. And the last, he says, is just being busy with activities that just don't matter. And we are all guilty of that. It is so easy for us to get caught up in that. And even the busyness of church, if it's against the opportunity to share the gospel, we can grow in knowledge, but if we don't share that, then we're not living a transformed life. And uh, I would encourage you to read the little booklet, Born to Reproduce. It's a 15 minute read and it is really uh, his story Uh, Titus 2 says but as for you teach what accords of sound doctrine older older men are to be sober minded dignified self controlled sound in faith and love and in steadfast older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior not slanders or slaves to much wine they are to teach what is good and so train the young woman to love their husbands and children Paul writing to Timothy, you then my child be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who are able to teach others also. Next, kingdom minded. We are not focused on an eternal kingdom, but usually our own little kingdom. Jesus says in Luke 9, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Are we focused on eternal matters? Are we focused on thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? R.C. Sproul says the disciples called him master. Their entire way of life changed because of their following Jesus, not merely as a great teacher, but as the Lord of all. That's the essence of discipleship, submitting fully to the authority of Christ, the one whose lordship goes beyond just the classroom. Jesus' lordship encompasses all of life. 
and David Livingston, the, the missionary to Africa who charted the vast majority of Africa and whose maps are still being used today, but did so by sharing the gospel as well, says, I place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the interest of the kingdom, it shall be given away or kept. Only as by giving or keeping it, I shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or eternity. And the last one, we must steward. We must be stewards. We are all called to steward. Martin Luther says that I've held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Amen. What a reminder. Peter writing to the church that is facing persecution says that above all keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins show hospitality to one another without grumbling as such has received a gift use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied gifts grace excuse me uh, we have all been gifted we have all been given with the same amount of time different talents and different treasure but we have all been gifted and how can we steward for god's good and god's glory last quote john macarthur says that all christians are but god's stewards everything we have is on loan from the lord entrusted to us for a while to use in serving him I've got a possibly a, a picture of uh, what modern day discipleship looks like compared to Jesus discipleship strategy. So on the left, you'll see the modern day where it is to gather everyone together. And then a few will get connected into some aspect of disciple mating, making. And then even fewer will ultimately serve and only a handful will go. On the contrary, Jesus' discipleship strategy was Jesus invested in a few. As a matter of fact, the three, to be precise, Peter, James, and John. Now you see under the three is the 12 disciples. And I'm sure there were moments that the other nine were he and Han. Well, there they go again. I guess this time he's going to have a transfiguration in front of them. Well, there he goes again. I guess this time he's going to raise somebody from the dead. We never get to see that. But those three he invested greatly in. But the other nine as well as they followed him. And out of those 12, he sent out the 70 to go out into the communities. And ultimately, by the time we get to 1 Corinthians 15, we see 500. It wasn't a, a mega church by any, strat by any level. But we know by Acts 17 that they had turned the world upside down. A few that are fully committed to Christ will see great things done. The last line in this uh, passage says, Whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Well, I heard this uh, a few years ago, and it's about uh, Dr. Howard Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly was a uh, renowned surgeon at John Hopkins uh, university for many years, world world renowned. Uh, he he had this to say: the night that he graduated from medical college, understand this is the guy top of his class, could go and do medical anywhere. He says, "Today I dedicate myself, my time, my capabilities, my ambition, everything to Him. Blessed Lord, sanctify me to Thy uses." Give me no worldly success which may not lead me nearer to my Savior. This uh, remarkable man, this uh, faithful, God-fearing man would uh, travel uh, quite often to do uh, small clinics and things, particularly in rural communities that did not have uh, the means in which to have a doctor or, or were nowhere near hospitals. In traveling once into the Midwest, he had been uh, scrummaging around town, helping those that uh, had need, and he knocked on a door, uh, not uh, the wrong door but uh, knocked on a door and a little girl came to the door and he asked the little girl if she minded he was very parched and he said do you mind if I could get a glass of water a seemingly little gesture well the little girl gave him uh, a glass of water she didn't know who he was she had no idea who he was uh, the story goes this is in um, Dr. Kelly's own journals uh, he remembered this little girl's name he remembered very distinctly this little girl who simply gave him a glass of water and 
Dr. Kelly shares the story that as uh, years would pass, uh, this little girl would, would grow into uh, this young woman. And this young woman came to John Hopkins with a, uh, a great deal of, of medical needs, uh, ones that were not taken care of. Uh, she would certainly die very soon. She had no insurance. She had no ability to, to, uh, to take care of any of the needs. But after Dr. Kelly took care of her and made sure all things were, were done, she received the bill in the mail. And the bill in the mail simply said, paid by one cup of water. Folks, it takes one little act in the name of Jesus when we are committed to the cause of Christ that can change a life eternally. It's not that we can change it. It is Christ who does that work. But he is simply calling us to be faithful, to be obedient, to respond to uh, wherever and whatever it is that God is leading you and I to do. The reality is we all can do something. For some of you, that may be a lot more than others. For some of you, may be, it may be that, that, that God willing, one day we will commission you, that you will be sent out somewhere. It might be to plant a church a mile away. It might be to be a missionary a thousand miles away, whatever it is. But, but we can all do something. Search and see what it is that God is calling you. We all must do something. But the first step for everyone here is that we have to have faith in Christ alone. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, then, then maybe today is the day. And if that's the case, we encourage you to let us know. Fill out one of those cards in the back of the seats. Let us know how we can help you as you start this great journey and that you look to uh, being baptized and publicly proclaiming uh, you uh, aligning with Christ, that Christ Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But make whatever that next step is that God has in store for you. Father, we thank you for your precious word, God, that you have reminded us today through your word and through uh, the testimonies of the work that you are doing in the lives of men and women and children halfway around the world and even in our own communities. That, God, you are on the throne, that you are drawing all peoples to yourself. That, God, you are not sending us to go anywhere, that you are not already at work. That, God, we will be joining you on the mission field. We will be standing beside our King Jesus, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we reach to those that have never heard the name of Jesus, as we serve in communities or areas that are desperate for the hope that we have, which is in Christ Jesus alone. So, Father, may you just guide and direct us. May you burden our hearts with those things that break yours. That, Father, you have gifted us with so much. We live in the most blessed nation in the world. We have more of everything than, than any other nation has. And, Father, it is at times because of that abundance that we seem to become so content and so complacent in what the ultimate mission of the gospel is. And it may not be that we will ever be called around the world. But may we at least be bold in declaring the gospel to our neighbors, our family members, our, 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 our friends who work next to us, or just those that we have uh, come in contact with. And may God, through all that we do, may we give glory and honor to your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.